I'm, I'm a white academic who works on racism, right? I, I'm not a person of color. I don't know what it's like to be walked around on the street and people looked at me and treated me certain ways at all the time. I need to listen, shut up and listen and learn from the people who deal with it every day. And that's kind of a basic humility that we just need. And Greta had that. And, and, and I really do believe that some of the young Belgian activists also have that. And I think that's, that's incredibly important. Um, but it's harder in Belgium because I think a lot of those marginalized communities do not feel safe speaking up because the racism and the sexism are just so bad here. Yeah, you can't blame them because you have uh, politicians that look up to Trump and stuff, so... Yeah, no, and that I mean, openly think say that in, in interviews. Right, exactly. The fact that it's become so normalized, I mean, you know, whether it was the welcome accord, right, which basically mm. made, you know, second-class citizens, or the recent, you know, regeringsakkord, mm. or, I mean, the way, or Macron, I believe, last week, the way that the, the media and politicians have so normalized mm -hmm. racism is, is, is shocking. Um, but I also think the fact that people have let it happen without protesting says it was something that was always in the soil, and I think it's in the soil because it's never been dealt with, right? Like when I see my kids going to a Belgian school system, I'm horrified. I mean, mm. do they learn about Congo? Do they learn about the history of Colombia? You know, no, they learn about the Zwarte Piet as a tradition, that's important. Like, mm. I mean, if that's what the youth are learning, then it's going to be super easy to normalize racism in the media or in the government because people don't know, you know, that it's so problematic and it's so pervasive in Belgium. Vorig jaar, omdat we daar echt in het heetste van het debat gewoon daarover bezig waren en dat ik gewoon over de kern aan het wandelen was en dat echt, ik zag drie boten passeren, allemaal met alle scouts die dan Zwarte Piet en Sint-Niklaas en die hadden dan allemaal echt gewoon nog... Sinterklaas, niet Sint-Niklaas. Sinterklaas. Ik zei toch Sinterklaas? Ja. Bon, maar echt nog Zwarte Piet met dikke lippen. met die trying to decolonize. Ja, En dus, maar gewoon ongegeneerd. Maar die discussie is er zo hard. Hoe kunnen we dat missen? En ik heb precies met heel veel debatten dat dat gewoon wordt genegeerd. Of van dat, dat is niet mijn strijd. Of dat is. Oh, wow. yeah. Ja, no, I, yeah, 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 I get it. And it's interesting because so we had a, in Canada we had an election just two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a huge discussion because Trudeau, who kind of mm -hmm. presents himself as like super liberal and lefty, which of course he's totally not when you look at climate or anything, whatever. Or his history of photos. Right, exactly, right? <laughs> look at his history of photos. And the discussion was, well, at that time they didn't know, I mean, which of course is bullshit, right? Yeah. And I think it's really very, very problematic in Belgium for people to say two things, right? One is, it's not problematic or this or that. Mm. And I think that's because they're not listening to people who are of color and ha what that does to them. But also, they haven't learned about the history about, you know, this particular figure, the way Zwarte Piet is depicted, is so directly linked mm -hmm. to the history of colonialism and slavery, you cannot separate it. So I kind of feel like, you know, if you want your cake, you have to, you know, eat the full thing. Like, we need to say, okay, if we're going to keep Zwarte Piet the way it is, and if we're going to allow people to be unashamedly dressed up in blackface, they better know that basically what they're doing is supporting this entire history of what made Belgium rich, mm -hmm. which is in fact slavery and colonialism. So I think it's incredibly important for them to say, you know, I mean, why is the hair curly? Why the earrings, right? That was what we, those are the objects we put on people to mark them as mm -hmm. property. I mean, you know, to turn somebody, a human being into property, right? That's the core of racism. It's dehumanization. It's denying that this person is a human being of equal worth, right? And that's, that's, I mean, Zwarte Piet in that sense is literally the embodiment of dehumanization, right? This, this figure who many young children fear, who's not even seen as a full human being, right? Like who's mm. marked as property, which he's traded and sold. And, and yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's shocking to me that it's so considered like a non-issue mm -hmm. and people aren't willing to and I think that's because people don't talk about it people don't make the connections don't learn about colonialism but also that you know let's say young white people don't realize that, that that's an issue for them I mean if you allow any particular group of people to be dehumanized mm -hmm. that means you first of all you know dehumanize yourself because you're denying your shared humanity it also means 
that any group which will ever be marginalized is never safe, right? I mean, there's this famous quote from um, a scholar for World War II, um, I think it was a theologian, who said something, I always get this wrong, like, when they came for the Marxists, I wasn't a Marxist, so I didn't say anything. When um, they came for the Catholics, I wasn't a Catholic, so I didn't say anything. Well, when they came for the Jews, I wasn't doing the same thing. So when they came for me, there was nobody left. Mm. And I think it's sort of important to realize again, if we do not have inclusion and justice for all, no one is ever safe. No one is ever going to be who they are and be part of the society. And how can we make a society together when so many people who are part of it don't feel included, don't feel welcome, don't feel safe, don't feel at home? I mean, in that sense, it connects to sexism, right? If you can't walk the streets feeling safe, how are you possibly going to engage in change on a political or community level, right? You're too busy being afraid, mm -hmm. right? And you're right. Absolutely every right for these people to be afraid because it's not a safe, inclusive system. It's a very, very unjust system. And Zorak the Pete is like the picture of that injustice. Um, what you said about uh, what you said, over dat we deze gesprekken moeten hebben, dat je een term moet, moet bovenhalen en dat we daarover moeten praten met onze vrienden, met familie, uh, met elkaar in dit soort uh, situaties, dat meer moet gebeuren. Um, daar geef ik u volledig gelijk in. Maar het is wel... Ik kan het helpen, want... Het helpt me. Ja, ja, ja. Dus ik denk... Eerst en vooral, ik denk niet dat we het onderschatten moeten that sometimes the hardest discussions are the ones in the family, right? So we have mm. this idea like to be an activist you have to go and get arrested and blah blah blah, but sometimes those discussions with, you know, people who are very close to you can be very painful and very difficult. I mean, I think about um, one particular student of mine who was uh, adopted by a white Dutch family and she's originally, like, she was adopted from Ethiopian parents. She was raised in this, you know, very white Dutch house, and uh, when she started trying to discuss with them about what Zwartepi did to her, they wouldn't listen. Like, they wouldn't listen. They just couldn't believe it. Like, you're calling me racist. And I think the, the sensitivity of, of white Belgians or white Dutch to the you're calling me racist thing, I think it's really important to be able to find a way to have these very difficult discussions in family, between friends, at school, on the streets, in the media, which of course the media doesn't want because the media of course is connected to a right-wing government. Um, but I think it's incredibly important because first of all, we need to know what we're talking about, right? And I think we need to be able to say, what is Islamophobia? What is racism? What is sexism? To be able to connect these different forms of exclusion to a, a slightly bigger picture where we can see why are particular people being excluded from particular spaces ja, als je zegt van um, wat, wat zijn die termen, wat is seksisme, wat is seksisme, maar dat is er toch al, of is dat, er zijn toch definities, of er zijn verschillende perspectieven ja. daarom, dus info is er, maar hoe, als je weet wat het is, dan... Well, I think, first of all, if we were to each give our definitions now of racism, you'd uh, see we have different ones. <laughs> yeah. But I think it makes it interesting. It makes it interesting to say, okay, yeah. what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'm always suspicious of is, who gets to define the term, right? Mm. I do not want a group of white sexist men to define what feminism is, right? I do not want the right wing populist, sort of, you know, almost fascist or even fascist to tell me what identity politics. Identity mm. politics is a term that comes from a left, comes from groups who are excluded. These are the people who should be defining the terms. And so it's important to say who's defining it. And then Each definition hides certain things and shows others, right? So like the definition of anti-Semitism shows certain things, but actually also points back to Israel, right? We have to be really careful about that happening. So I work with a, a group of, of scholars so from different backgrounds, but also different disciplines. And so I'm in philosophy, and I think one of the very few things philosophers are good for is, you know, what we try to do is look at all these different definitions and try to get to the core, like what do certain concepts mean? And in my particular case, I'm interested, of course, in racism and sexism, these terms. And as I said before, I think one of the key things in racism is the dehumanization. So that there's a hierarchy, certain people are deemed fully human beings, and then you have some people who are slightly less, something, some subhuman, and then a group of people often, who are often the most 
people of color, poor people, who were really not treated and deemed as human beings, right? And mm -hmm. in the past, that's what geno justified genocide, uh, the Shoah, colonialism, because there was a group which we could make profit from, but they were not seen as human beings. And so for me, denial of somebody's humanity, and of course this happens in our current politicians, or this happens in the media, in very subtle ways, right? So mm -hmm. you need to not be even able to subtle even anymore. <laughs> no, but it's important to say, when I say demonization, denial of humanity, what you see is very often othering. So suggesting somebody is slightly different, different or yeah. other. Oh, yeah. But if they were to, for example, convert or take off their veil, well, then they'd be included. But that's, of course, bullshit. Because mm -hmm. the reality of it is, is that's just part of the game. Mm -hmm. No matter what, certain groups of people, because of their gender, their color of skin, their religion, will never be fully included until everybody's included, right? Which means we need to completely change the hierarchy. But mm -hmm. the hierarchy makes itself invisible. Right? Mm. So, for example, people now say, oh, yeah, we're all secular, right? That's crap. I mean, and this is easy, right? As a Jew, I can walk around the streets and tell you all the reasons why this is not secular or neutral or inclusive, right? And talking to any of my Muslim friends, they can do it as well, right? Anybody who's not part of the Christian or post-Christian group can sense and feel why, you know, it's all hidden. And, the, you know, the media does it as well. The politicians do it. And then they normalize it. Right? They make it just seem so normal, right? People don't even think or question about this whole discourse of secularism mm. and what that does to people who are not part of that group. I mean, it's so it's so normal here that, yeah, it's, it's almost, it makes it very, very hard to fight. So simply talking about it and, and defining it is a very important step in fighting it.